Part Two, Chapter Three, The Man of Property. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Harnick. The Foresight Saga, The Man of Property by John Goldsworthy. Part Two, Chapter Three, Drive with Swizzin. Two lines of a certain song in a certain famous old school's songbook run as follows: How the buttons on his blue frock shone, tra la la! How he carolled and he sang like a bird. Swizzin did not exactly carol and sing like a bird, but he felt almost like endeavouring to hum a tune as he stepped out of Hyde Park Mansions and contemplated his horses drawn up before the door. The afternoon was as balmy as a day in June, and to complete the similar of the old song, he had put on a blue frock coat, dispensing with an overcoat, after sending Adolf down three times to make sure that there was not the least suspicion of east in the wind, and the frock coat was buttoned so tightly around his personable form that if the buttons did not shine, they might pardonably have done so. Majestic on the pavement, he fitted on a pair of dogskin gloves with his large bell-shaped top hat and his great stature and bulk, he looked too primeval for a foresight. His thick white hair, on which Adolf had bestowed a touch of pomatum, exhaled the fragrance of apoponax and cigars, the celebrated Swissin brand for which he paid one hundred and forty shillings the hundred, and of which old Jolyon had unkindly said he wouldn't smoke them as a gift. They wanted the stomach of a horse. Adolf, Shire, the new play drug. He would never teach that fellow to look smart. And Mrs. Soames, he felt sure, had an eye. The phaeton hood down, I am going to drive a lady. A pretty woman would want to show off her frock, and, well, he was going to drive a lady. It was like a new beginning to the good old days. Ages since he had driven a woman. The last time, if he remembered, it had been Julie. The poor old soul had been as nervous as a cat the whole time, and so put him out of patience that, as he dropped her in the Bayswater Road, he had said, Well, I am damned if I ever drive you again. And he never had, not he. Going up to his horses' heads, he examined their bits. Not that he knew anything about bits. He did not pay his coachman sixty pounds a year to do his work for him. That had never been his principle. Indeed, his reputation as a horsey man rested mainly on the fact that once on Derby Day he had been welshed by some thimble riggers. But someone at the club, after seeing him drive his greys up to the door, he always drove grey horses, you got more style for the money, some thought, had called him four in hand foresight. The name having reached his ears through that fellow Nicholas Streffrey, old Jolyon's dead partner, the great driving man notorious for more carriage accidents than any man in the kingdom, Swizzin had ever after conceived it right to act up to it. The name had taken his fancy, not because he had ever driven four in hand, or was ever likely to, but because of something distinguished in the sound. Four in hand foresight. Not bad. Born too soon, Swizzin had missed his vocation. Coming upon London twenty years later, he could not have failed 
to have become a stockbroker, but at the time when he was obliged to select, this great profession had not as yet become the chief glory of the upper middle class. He had literally been forced into land agency. Once in the driving seat, with the reins handed to him, and blinking over his pale old cheeks in the full sunlight, he took a slow look around. Adolf was already up behind. The cockaded groom at the horses' heads stood ready to let go. Everything was prepared for the signal, and Swithin gave it. The equipage dashed forward, and before you could say, Jack Robinson, with a rattle and flourish, drew up at Soames's door. Irene came out at once, and stepped in. He afterward described it at Timothy's, as light as, uh, Taglioni, no fuss about it, no wanting this or wanting that. And, above all, Swithin dwelt on this, staring at Mrs. Septimus in a way that disconcerted her a good deal, no silly nervousness. To Aunt Hester he portrayed Irene's hat, not one of your great flopping things, sprawling about and catching the dust, that women are so fond of nowadays, but a neat little, he made a circular motion of his hand, white veil, capital taste. What was it made of? inquired Aunt Hester, who manifested a languid but permanent excitement at any mention of dress. Made of? returned Swithin. Now how should I know? He sank into silence so profound that Aunt Hester began to be afraid he had fallen into a trance. She did not try to rouse him herself, it not being her custom. I wish somebody would come, she thought. I don't like the look of him. But suddenly Swithin returned to life. Made of, he wheezed out slowly, what should it be made of? They had not gone four miles before Swithin received the impression that Irene liked driving with him. Her face was so soft behind that white veil, and her dark eyes shone so in the spring light, and whenever he spoke she raised them to him and smiled. On Saturday morning Soames had found her at her writing table with a note written to Swithin, putting him off. Why did she want to put him off? he asked. She might put her own people off when she liked. He wouldn't have her putting off his people. She had looked at him intently, had torn up the note and said, Very well. And then she began writing another. He took a casual glance presently and saw that it was addressed to Bosini. What are you writing to him about? he asked. Irene, looking at him again with that intent look, said quietly, Something he wanted me to do for him. Hum, said Soames, commissions. You'll have your work cut out if you begin that sort of thing. He said no more. Swithin opened his eyes at the mention of Robin Hill. It was a long way for his horses, and he always dined at half-past seven before the rush at the club began. The new chef took more trouble with an early dinner. A lazy rascal. He would like to have a look at the house, however. A house appealed to any foresight, and especially to one who had been an auctioneer. After all, he said, the distance was nothing. When he was a younger man, he had had rooms at Richmond for many years, kept his carriage and pair there, and drove them up and down to business every day of his life. Four-in-hand foresight, they called him. His tea cart, his horses had been known from Hyde Park Corner to the Star and Garter. The Duke of Z wanted to get hold of them, would have given him double the money but he had kept them. 
No a good thing when you have it, eh? A look of solemn pride came portentously on his shaven, square old face. He rolled his head in his stand-up collar like a turkey cock preening himself. She was really a charming woman. He enlarged upon her frock afterwards to Aunt Julie, who held up her hands at his way of putting it. Fitted her like a skin, tight as a drum. That was how he liked them, all of a piece, none of your daverdy scarecrow women. He gazed at Mrs. Septimus Small, who took after James, long and thin. There is style about her, he went on, fit for a king. And she is so quiet with it, too. She seems to have made quite a conquest of you, anyway, drawled Aunt Hester from her corner. Swithin heard extremely well when anybody attacked him. What's that? he said. I know a pretty woman when I see one. And all I can say is, I don't see the young man about that is fit for her. But perhaps you do. Come, perhaps you do. Oh, murmured Aunt Hester, asked Julie. Long before they reached Robin Hill, however, the unaccustomed airing had made him terribly sleepy. He drove with his eyes closed, a lifetime of deportment alone keeping his tall and bulky form from falling askew. Bosney, who was watching, came out to meet them, and all three entered the house together. Swithin in front making play with a stout gold-mounted malacca cane put into his hand by Adolf, for his knees were feeling the effects of their long stay in the same position. He had assumed his fur coat to guard against the draughts of the unfinished house. The staircase, he said, was handsome. The baronial style, they would want some statuary about. He came to a standstill between the columns of the doorway into the inner court and held out his cane inquiringly. What was this to be, this vestibule, or whatever they called it? But gazing at the skylight, inspiration came to him. Ah, the billiard room! When told it was to be a tiled court with plants in the centre, he turned to Irene. Waste this on plants? You take my advice, and have a billiard table here. Irene smiled. She had lifted her veil, bending it like a nun's coif across her forehead, and the smile of her dark eyes below this seemed to Swithin more charming than ever. He nodded. She would take his advice. He saw. He had little to say of the drawing or dining rooms, which he described as spacious but fell into such raptures as he permitted to a man of his dignity in the wine cellar, to which he descended by stone steps, Bosini going first with a light. You will have room here, he said, for six or seven hundred dozen, a very pooty little cellar. Bosini, having expressed the wish to show them the house from the copse below, Swizin came to a stop. There is a fine view from here, he remarked. You haven't such a thing as a chair. A chair was brought him from Bosini's tent. You go down, he said blandly. You too. I will sit here and look at the view. He sat down by the oak tree in the sun, square and upright, with one hand stretched out, resting on the knob of his cane, the other planted on his knee, his fur coat thrown open, his hat roofing with its flat top the pale square of his face, his stare, very blank, fixed on the landscape. He nodded to them as they went off down through the fields. He was, indeed, not sorry to be left thus for a quiet moment of reflection. The air was balmy, not too much heat in the sun. The prospect, a fine one. 
a remarker. His head fell a little to one side. He jerked it up and thought, Odd. He. Ah. They were waving to him from the bottom. He put up his hand and moved it more than once. They were active. The prospect was remar. His head fell to the left. He jerked it up at once. It fell to the right. It remained there. He was asleep. And asleep, a sentinel on the top of the rise, he appeared to rule over his prospect. Remarkable, like some image blocked out by the special artist of primeval foresights in pagan days to record the domination of mind over matter. And all the unnumbered generations of his yeoman ancestors want of a Sunday to stand akimbo, surveying their little plots of land, their grey unmoving eyes hiding their instinct with its hidden roots of violence, their instinct for possession to the exclusion of all the world, all these unnumbered generations seemed to sit there with him on the top of the rise, but from him, thus slumbering, his jealous foresight spirit travelled far into God knows what jungle of fancies, with those two young people, to see what they were doing down there in the copse, in the copse where the spring was running riot with the scent of sap and bursting buds, the song of birds innumerable a carpet of bluebells and sweet-growing things, and the sun caught like gold in the tops of the trees, to see what they were doing, walking along there so close together on the path that was too narrow, walking along there so close that they were always touching, to watch Irene's eyes like dark thieves stealing the heart out of the spring. And the great unseen chaperone, his spirit was there, stopping with them to look at the little furry corpse of a mole, not dead an hour, with his mushroom and silver coat untouched by the rain or dew, watching over Irene's bent head and the soft look of her pitying eyes, and over that young man's head, gazing at her so hard, so strangely. Walking on with them, too, across the open space where a woodcutter had been at work, where the bluebells were trampled down and the trunk had swayed and staggered down from its gashed stump. Climbing it with them, over and on to the very edge of the copse, whence there stretched an undiscovered country from far away in which came the sounds cuckoo cuckoo silent standing with them there and uneasy at their silence very queer very strange then back again as though guilty through the wood back to the cutting still silent amongst the songs of birds that never ceased, and the wild scent, hm, what was it, like that herb they put in, back to the log across the pass. And then unseen, uneasy, flapping about them, trying to make noises, his foresight spirit watched her balanced on the log, her pretty figure swaying, smiling down at that young man gazing up with such strange shining eyes slipping now ah falling oh sliding down his breast her soft warm body clutched her head bent back from his lips his kiss her recoil his cry you must know i love you must know indeed a pretty love ha swithin awoke virtue had gone out of him he had a taste in his mouth 
Where was he? Damn! He had been asleep. He had dreamed something about a new soup with a taste of mint in it. Those young people, where had they got to? His left leg had pins and needles. Adolf? The rascal was not there. The rascal was asleep somewhere. He stood up, tall, square, bulky in his fur, looking anxiously down over the fields, and presently he saw them coming. Irina was in front. That young fella, what had they nicknamed him? The Buccaneer, looked precious hangdog there behind her. Had got a flea in his ear, he shouldn't wonder. Serve him right, taking her down all that way to look at the house. The proper place to look at the house from was the lawn. They saw him. He extended his arm and moved it spasmodically to encourage them. But they had stopped. What were they standing there for? Talking, talking. They came on again. She had been giving him a rub. He had not the least doubt of it. And no wonder, over a house like that, a great ugly thing, not the sort of house he was accustomed to. He looked intently at their faces, with his pale, immovable stare. That young man looked very queer. "'You'll never make anything of this,' he said tartly, pointing at the mansion. Two new-fangled.' Bosini gazed at him as though he had not heard, and Swithin afterwards described him to Aunt Hester as an extravagant sort of fellow, very odd way of looking at you, a bumpy beggar. What gave rise to this sudden piece of psychology he did not state. Possibly Bosini's prominent forehead and cheekbones and chin, or something hungry in his face, which quarrelled with Swizin's conception of the calm satiety that should characterize the perfect gentleman. He brightened up at the mention of tea. He had a contempt for tea. His brother Jolyon had been in tea, made a lot of money by it, but he was so thirsty and had such a taste in his mouth that he was prepared to drink anything. He longed to inform Irene of the taste in his mouth. She was so sympathetic, but it would not be a distinguished thing to do. He rolled his tongue round and faintly smacked it against his palate. In a far corner of the tent, Adolf was bending his cat-like moustaches over a kettle. He left it at once to draw the cork of a pint bottle of champagne. Swizin smiled and nodding at Bosini said, Why, you are quite a Monte Cristo. This celebrated novel, one of the half dozen, he had read had produced an extraordinary impression on his mind. Taking his glass from the table, he held it away from him to scrutinize the color. Thirsty as he was, it was not likely that he was going to drink trash. Then placing it to his lips, he took a sip. A very nice wine, he said at last, passing it before his nose, not the equal of my hide seek. It was at this moment that the idea came to him which he afterwards imparted at Timothy's in this nutshell. I shouldn't wonder a bit if that architect chap were sweet upon Mrs. Soames. And from this moment his pale round eyes never ceased to bulge with the interest of his discovery. The fellow, he said to Mrs. Septimus, follows her about with his eyes like a dog, the bumpy beggar. I don't wonder at it. She is a very charming woman, and I should say the pink of discretion. 
a vague consciousness of perfume caging about Irene, like that from a flower with half-closed petals and a passionate heart, moved him to the creation of this image. But I wasn't sure of it, he said, till I saw him pick up her handkerchief. Mrs. Small's eyes boiled with excitement. And did he give it her back, she asked. Give it back, said Swithin. I saw him slobber on it when he thought I wasn't looking. Mrs. Moore gasped, too interested to speak. But she gave him no encouragement, went on Swithin. He stopped and stared for a minute or two in the way that alarmed Aunt Hester so. He had suddenly recollected that as they were starting back in the phaeton, she had given Bosony her hand a second time, and let it stay there too. He had touched his horses smartly with the whip, anxious to get her all to himself. But she had looked back, and she had not answered his first question, neither had he been able to see her face, she had kept it hanging down. There is somewhere a picture which Swithin has not seen, of a man sitting on a rock and by him immersed in the still green water, a sea nymph flying on her back with her hand on her naked breast. She has a half smile on her face, a smile of hopeless surrender and of secret joy. Seated by Swithin's side, Irene may have been smiling like that. When warmed by champagne, he had her all to himself, he unbosomed himself of his wrongs, of his smothered resentment against the new chef at the club, his worry over the house in Wigmore Street, where the rascally tenant had gone bankrupt through helping his brother-in-law, as if charity did not begin at home. Of his deafness, too, and that pain he sometimes got in his right side. She listened, her eyes swimming under their lids. He thought she was thinking deeply of his troubles, and pitied himself terribly. Yet in his fur coat, with frogs across the breast, his top hat aslant, driving this beautiful woman, he had never felt more distinguished. A coaster, however, taking his girl for a Sunday airing, seemed to have the same impression about himself. This person had flocked his donkey into a gallop alongside and sat upright as a waxwork, in his shallopy chariot, his chin settled pompously on a red handkerchief, like Swizin's, on his full cravat, while his girl, with the ends of a fly-brown boar floating out behind, aped the woman of fashion. Her swain moved a stick with a ragged bit of string dangling from the end, reproducing with strange fidelity the circular flourish of Swithin's whip, and rolled his head at his lady with a leer that had a weird likeness to Swithin's primeval stare. Though for a time unconscious of the lowly ruffian's presence, Swithin presently took it into his head that he was being guided. He laid his whip, Lash, across the mare's flank. The two chariots, however, by some unfortunate fatality, continued abreast. Swithin's yellow, puffy face grew red. He raised his whip to Lash, the coaster monger, but was saved from so far forgetting his dignity by a special intervention of providence. A carriage driving out through a gate forced Phaeton and donkey cart into proximity. The wheels grated, the lighter vehicle skidded and was overturned. Swizin did not look round.
on no account would he have pulled up to help the ruffian serve him right if he had broken his neck but he could not if he would the grace had taken alarm the phaeton swung from side to side and people raised frightened faces as they went dashing past swizzing great arms stretched at full length tugged at the reins his cheeks were puffed his lips compressed his swollen face was of a dull angry red irene had her hand on the rail and at every lurch she gripped it tightly swizzin heard her ask are we going to have an accident uncle swizzin he gasped out between his pants it is nothing a little fresh i have never been in an accident don't you move he took a look at her she was smiling perfectly calm sit still he repeated never fear i will get you home and in the midst of all his terrible efforts he was surprised to hear her answer in a voice not like her own i don't care if i never get home the carriage giving a terrific lurch swizzin's exclamation was jerked back into his throat the horses winded by the rise of a hill now steadied to a trot and finally stopped of their own accord when swizzin described it at timothy's i pulled them up there she was as cool as myself god bless my soul she behaved as if she didn't care whether she broke her neck or not what was it she said i don't care if i never get home leaning over the handle of his cane he wheezed out to mrs small's terror and i am not altogether surprised with a finikin feller like young soames for a husband it did not occur to him to wonder what bosinney had done after they had left him there alone whether he had gone wandering about like the dog to which swizzin had compared him wandering down to that copse where the spring was still in riot the cuckoo still calling from afar gone down there with her handkerchief pressed to lips its fragrance mingling with the scent of mint and thyme gone down there with such a wild exquisite pain in his heart that he could have cried out among the trees or what indeed the fellow had done in fact till he came to timothy's swizzin had forgotten all about him end of part two chapter three drive with swizzin recording by eva harnick part two chapter number four of the man of property this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by eva harnick the foresight saga the man of property by john galsworthy part two chapter four james goes to see for himself those ignorant of foresight change would not perhaps foresee all the stir made by irene's visit to the house after swizzin had related at timothy's the full story of his memorable drive the same with the least suspicion of curiosity the merest touch of malice and a real desire to do good was passed on to june and what a dreadful thing to say my dear ended aunt julie that about not going home what did she mean it was a strange recital for the girl she heard it flushing painfully and suddenly with a curt handshake took her departure 
almost rude mrs small said to aunt hester when june was gone the proper construction was put on her reception of the news she was upset something was therefore very wrong odd she and irene had been such friends it all tallied too well with whispers and hints that had been going about for some time past recollections of euphemia's account of the visit to the theatre mr bosony always at Soames's. oh indeed yes of course he would be about the house nothing open only upon the greatest the most important provocation was it necessary to say anything open on forsyth's change this machine was too nicely adjusted a hint the merest trifling expression of regret or doubt sufficed to set the family soul so sympathetic vibrating no one desired that harm should come of these vibrations far from it they were set in motion with the best intentions with the feeling that each member of the family had a stake in the family soul and much kindness lay at the bottom of the gossip it would frequently result in visits of condolence being made in accordance with the customs of society thereby conferring a real benefit upon the sufferers and affording consolation to the sound who felt pleasantly that someone at all events was suffering from that from which they themselves were not suffering in fact it was simply a desire to keep things well aired the desire which animates the public press that brought james for instance into communication with mrs septimus mrs septimus with the little nicholases the little nicholases with who knows whom and so on that great class to which they had risen and now belonged demanded a certain candor a still more certain reticence this combination guaranteed their membership many of the younger foresights felt very naturally and would openly declare that they did not want their affairs pried into but so powerful was the invisible magnetic current of family gossip that for the life of them they could not help knowing all about everything it was felt to be hopeless one of them young roger had made a heroic attempt to free the rising generation by speaking of timothy as an old cat the effort had justly recoiled upon himself the words coming round in the most delicate way to aunt julie's ears were repeated by her in a shocked voice to mrs roger whence they returned again to young roger and after all it was only the wrongdoers who suffered as for instance george when he lost all that money playing billiards or young roger himself when he was so dreadfully near to marrying the girl to whom it was whispered he was already married by the laws of nature or again irene who was thought rather than said to be in danger all this was not only pleasant but salutary and it made so many hours go lightly at timothy's in the bayswater road so many hours that must otherwise have been sterile and heavy to those three who lived there and timothy's was but one of the hundreds of such homes in this city of london the homes of neutral persons of the secure classes who are out of the battle themselves and must find their reason for existing 
in the battles of others. But for the sweetness of family gossip, it must indeed have been lonely there. Rumors and tales, reports, surmises, were they not the children of the house, as dear and precious as the prattling babes the brother and sisters had missed in their own journey? To talk about them was as near as they could get to the possession of all those children and grandchildren after whom their soft hearts yearned. For though it is doubtful whether Timothy's heart yearned, it is indubitable that at the arrival of each fresh foresight child he was quite upset. Useless for young Roger to say, old cat, for Euphemia to hold up her hands and cry, oh, those three, and break into her silent laugh with the squeak at the end, useless and not too kind. The situation, which at this stage might seem, and especially to foresight eyes, strange, not to say impossible, was, in view of certain facts, not so strange after all. Some things had been lost sight of, and first in the security bred of many harmless marriages, it had been forgotten that love is no hothouse flower, but a wild plant born of a wet night, born of an hour of sunshine, sprung from wild seed, blown along the road by a wild wind. A wild plant that when it blooms by chance within the hedge of our gardens, we call a flower, and when it blooms outside, we call a weed. But flower or weed, whose scent and color are always wild. And further, the facts and figures of their own lives being against the perception of this truth, it was not generally recognized by foresights that where this wild plant springs, men and women are but moths around the pale, flame-like blossom. It was long since young Julian's escapade. There was danger of a tradition again arising that people in their position never crossed the hedge to pluck that flower, that one could reckon on having love like measles once in due season and getting over it comfortably for all time, as with measles on a soothing mixture of butter and honey in the arms of wedlock. Of all those whom this strange rumour about Bosney and Mrs. Soames reached, James was the most affected. He had long forgotten how he had hovered, lanky and pale, in side whiskers of chestnut hue round Emily in the days of his own courtship. He had long forgotten the small house in the purlieus of Mayfair, where he had spent the early days of his married life, or rather, he had long forgotten the early days, not the small house. A foresight never forgot a house. He had afterwards sold it at a clear profit of four hundred pounds. He had long forgotten those days with their hopes and fears and doubts about the prudence of the match, for Emily, though pretty, had nothing, and he himself at that time was making a bare thousand a year. And that strange, irresistible attraction which had drawn him on till he felt he must die, if he could not marry the girl with the fair hair looped so neatly back, the fair arms emerging from a skin-tight bodice, the fair form decorously shielded by a cage of really stupendous circumference. James had passed through the fire, but he had passed also through the river of years which washes out the fire. He had experienced the saddest experience of all, 
forgetfulness of what it was like to be in love forgotten forgotten so long that he had forgotten even that he had forgotten and now this rumor had come upon him this rumor about his son's wife very vague a shadow dodging among the palpable straightforward appearances of things unreal unintelligible as a ghost but carrying with it like a ghost inexplicable terror he tried to bring it home to his mind but it was no more use than trying to apply to himself one of those tragedies he read of daily in his evening paper he simply could not there could be nothing in it it was all their nonsense she did not get on with Soames as well as she might but she was a good little thing, a good little thing. Like the not inconsiderable majority of men, James relished a nice little bit of scandal and would say, in a matter-of-fact tone, licking his lips, yes, yes, she and young Dyson, they tell me they are living at Monte Carlo. But the significance of an affair of this sort of its past, its present, or its future, had never struck him. What it meant, what torture and raptures had gone to its construction, what slow, overmastering fate had lurked within the facts, very naked, sometimes sordid, but generally spicy, presented to his gaze. He was not in the habit of blaming, praising, drawing deductions, or generalizing at all about such things. He simply listened rather greedily and repeated what he was told, finding considerable benefit from the practice as from the consumption of a sherry and bitters before a meal. Now, however, that such a thing, or rather the rumor, the breath of it, had come near him personally, he felt as in a fog which filled his mouth full of a bad, thick flavour and made it difficult to draw breath. A scandal, a possible scandal. To repeat this word to himself thus was the only way in which he could focus or make it thinkable. He had forgotten the sensations necessary for understanding the progress, fate, or meaning of any such business. He simply could no longer grasp the possibilities of people running any risk for the sake of passion. Amongst all those persons of his acquaintance who went into the city day after day and did their business there, whatever it was, and in their leisure moments bought shares and houses and ate dinners and played games, as he was told, it would have seemed to him ridiculous to suppose that there were any who would run risks for the sake of anything so recondite, so figurative as passion. Passion, he seemed indeed to have heard of it, and rules such as a young man and a young woman ought never to be trusted together, were fixed in his mind as the parallels of latitude are fixed on a map, for all foresights, when it comes to bedrock matters of fact, have quite a fine taste in realism. But as to anything else, well, he could only appreciate it all through the catchword scandal. Ah, but there was no truth in it. Could not be. He was not afraid. She was really a good little thing. But there it was when you got a thing like that into your mind. And James was of a nervous temperament. One of those men whom things will not leave alone, who suffer tortures from anticipation and indecision, for fear of letting something slip that he might otherwise secure. He was physically unable to make up his mind until absolutely certain that by not making it up 
he would suffer loss. In life, however, there were many occasions when the business of making up his mind did not even rest with himself, and this was one of them. What could he do? Talk it over with Soames? That would only make matters worse. And after all, there was nothing in it he felt sure. It was all that house. He had mistrusted the idea from the first. What did Soames want to go into the country for? And if he must go spending a lot of money building himself a house, why not have a first-rate man, instead of this young Bosony, whom nobody knew anything about? He had told them how it would be, and he had heard that the house was costing Soames a pretty penny beyond what he had reckoned on spending. This fact, more than any other, brought home to James the real danger of the situation. It was always like this with these artistic chaps. A sensible man should have nothing to say to them. He had worn Irene too, and see what had come of it. And it suddenly sprung into James's mind that he ought to go and see for himself. In the midst of that fog of uneasiness in which his mind was enveloped, the notion that he could go and look at the house afforded him inexplicable satisfaction. It may have been simply the decision to do something, more possibly the fact that he was going to look at a house that gave him relief. He felt that in staring at an edifice of bricks and mortar of wood and stone built by the suspected man himself, he would be looking into the heart of that rumour about Irene. Without saying a word, therefore, to anyone, he took a hansom to the station and proceeded by train to Robin Hill. Thence, there being no flies in accordance with the custom of the neighbourhood, he found himself obliged to walk. He started slowly up the hill, his angular knees and high shoulders bent complainingly, his eyes fixed on his feet, yet neat for all that in his high hat and his frock coat, on which was the speckless gloss imparted by perfect superintendence. Emily saw to that. That is, she didn't, of course, see to it. People of good position not seeing to each other's buttons. And Emily was of good position. But she saw that the butler saw to it. He had to ask his way three times. On each occasion he repeated the directions given him, got the man to repeat them, then repeated them a second time, for he was naturally of a talkative disposition, and one could not be too careful in a new neighbourhood. He kept assuring them that it was a new house he was looking for. It was only, however, when he was shown the roof through the trees that he could feel really satisfied that he had not been directed entirely wrong. A heavy sky seemed to cover the world with grey whiteness of a whitewashed ceiling. There was no freshness or fragrance in the air. On such a day even British workmen scarcely cared to do more than they were obliged, and moved about their business without the drone of talk which whiles away the pangs of labour. Through spaces of the unfinished house shirt sleeve figures worked slowly, and sounds arose, spasmodic knockings, the scraping of metal, the sawing of wood, with the rumble of wheelbarrows along boards. Now and again the foreman's dog, tethered by a string to an oaken beam, whimpered feebly with a sound like the singing of a cattle. The fresh-fitted window panes, daubed each with a white patch in the centre, stared out at James like the eyes of a blind dog. 
and the building chorus went on strident and merciless under the grey white sky but the thrushes hunting amongst the fresh turned earth for worms were silent quite james picked his way among the heaps of gravel the drive was being laid till he came opposite the porch here he stopped and raised his eyes there was but little to see from this point of view and that little he took in at once but he stayed in this position many minutes and who shall know of what he thought his china blue eyes under white eyebrows that jutted out in little horns never stirred the long upper lip of his wide mouth between the fine white whiskers twitched once or twice it was easy to see from that anxious rapt expression when Soames derived the handicapped look which sometimes came upon his face. James might have been saying to himself, I don't know, life is a tough job. In this position Bosini surprised him. James brought his eyes down from whatever bird's nest they had been looking for in the sky to Bosini's face on which was a kind of humorous scorn how do you do mr forsyte come down to see for yourself it was exactly what james as we know had come for and he was made correspondingly uneasy he held out his hand however saying how are you without looking at bosinney the latter made way for him with an ironical smile James scented something suspicious in this courtesy. I should like to walk round the outside first, he said, and see what you have been doing. A flagged terrace of rounded stones, with a list of two or three inches to port, had been laid round the south-east and south-west sides of the house, and ran with a beveled edge into mould, which was in preparation for being turfed. Along this terrace James led the way. Now, what did this cost? he asked, when he saw the terrace extending round the corner. What should you think? inquired Bosini. How should I know? replied James, somewhat nonplussed. Two or three hundred, I dare say? The exact sum. James gave him a sharp look, but the architect appeared unconscious, and he put the answer down to mishearing. On arriving at the garden entrance, he stopped to look at the view. That ought to come down, he said, pointing to the oak tree. You think so? You think that with the tree there, you don't get enough view for your money? Again James eyed him suspiciously. This young man had a peculiar way of putting things. Well, he said, with a perplexed, nervous emphasis, I don't see what you want with a tree. It shall come down tomorrow, said Bosini. James was alarmed. Oh, he said, don't go saying I said it was to come down. I know nothing about it. No? James went on in a fluster. Why, what should I know about it? It is nothing to do with me. You do it on your own responsibility. You will allow me to mention your name. James grew more and more alarmed. I don't know what you want mentioning my name for, he muttered. You should better leave the tree alone. It is not your tree. He took out a silk handkerchief and wiped his brow. They entered the house. Like Swithin, James was impressed by the inner courtyard. You must have spent a deuce of a lot of money here, he said after staring at the columns and gallery for some time. Now, what did it cost to put up those columns? I can't tell you offhand, thoughtfully answered Bosini, but I know it was a deuce of a lot. 
I should think so, said James. I should. He caught the architect's eye and broke off. And now, whenever he came to anything of which he desired to know the cost, he stifled that curiosity. Bosini appeared determined that he should see everything, and had not James been of too noticing a nature, he would certainly have found himself going round the house a second time. He seemed so anxious to be asked questions too, that James felt he must be on his guard. He began to suffer from his exertions, for though wiry enough for a man of his long build, he was seventy-five years old. He grew discouraged. He seemed no nearer to anything, had not obtained from his inspection any of the knowledge he had vaguely hoped for. He had merely increased his dislike and mistrust of this young man who had tired him out with his politeness and in whose manner he now certainly detected mockery. The fellow was sharper than he had thought, and better looking than he had hoped. He had a, a don't-care appearance that James, to whom risk was the most intolerable thing in life, did not appreciate. A peculiar smile, too, coming when least expected, and very queer eyes. He reminded James, as he said afterwards, of a hungry cat. This was as near as he could get in conversation with Emily to a description of the peculiar exasperation, velvetiness, and mockery of which Bosini's manner had been composed. At last, having seen all that was to be seen, he came out again at the door where he had gone in, and now, feeling that he was wasting time and strength and money, all for nothing. He took the courage of a foresight in both hands and looking sharply at Bosini said, I dare say you see a good deal of my daughter-in-law now. What does she think of the house? But she hasn't seen it, I suppose. This he said knowing all about Irene's visit, not of course that there was anything in the visit except that extraordinary remark she had made about not caring to get home and the story of how June had taken the news. He had determined by this way of putting the question to give Bosini a chance as he said to himself. The latter was long in answering but kept his eyes with uncomfortable steadiness on James. She has seen the house, but I can't tell you what she thinks of it. Nervous and baffled, James was constitutionally prevented from letting the matter drop. Oh, he said, she has seen it. Soames brought her down, I suppose. Bosini smilingly replied, Oh, no. What? Did she come down alone? Oh, no. Then who brought her? I really don't know whether I ought to tell you who brought her. To James, who knew that it was Swithin, this answer appeared incomprehensible. Why, he stammered, you know that... Uh... But he stopped suddenly perceiving his danger. Well, he said, if you don't want to tell me, I suppose you won't. Nobody tells me anything. Somewhat to his surprise, Bosini asked him a question. By the by, he said, could you tell me if there are likely to be any more of you coming down? I should like to be on the spot. Any more, said James, bewildered. Who should there be more? I don't know of any more. Goodbye. Looking at the ground, he held out his hand, crossed the palm of it with Bosinis, and taking his umbrella just above the silk, walked away along the terrace. Before he turned the corner, he glanced back and saw Bosini following him slowly, 
slinking along the wall, as he put it to himself, like a great cat. He paid no attention when the young fellow raised his hat. Outside the drive and out of sight, he slackened his pace still more, very slowly, more bent than when he came, lean, hungry and disheartened, he made his way back to the station. The buccaneer, watching him go so sadly home, felt sorry, perhaps, for his behavior to the old man. End of Part 2, Chapter 4 James Goes to See for Himself Recording by Eva Harnick Part 2, Chapter 5 of The Man of Property This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter The Man of Property by John Galsworthy Part 2 Chapter 5 Soames and Bossini Correspond James said nothing to his son of this visit to the house, but, having occasion to go to Timothy's one morning on a matter connected with a drainage scheme, which was being forced by the sanitary authorities on his brother, he mentioned it there. It was not, he said, a bad house. He could see that a good deal could be made of it. The fellow was clever in his way, though what it was going to cost Soames before it was done he didn't know. Euphemia Forsyte, who happened to be in the room— she had come round to borrow the Reverend Mr. Scholes' last novel, Passion and Paragoric, which was having such a vogue, chimed in. I saw Irene yesterday at the stores. She and Mr. Bassini were having a nice little chat in the groceries. It was thus, simply, that she recorded a scene which had really made a deep and complicated impression on her. She had been hurrying to the silk department of the church and commercial stores, that institution than which, with its admirable system, admitting only guaranteed persons on a basis of payment before delivery, no emporium can be more highly recommended to foresights, to match a piece of prunella silk for her mother, who was waiting in the carriage outside. Passing through the groceries, her eye was unpleasantly attracted by the back view of a very beautiful figure. It was so charmingly proportioned, so balanced, and so well clothed, that Euphemia's instinctive propriety was at once alarmed. Such figures, she knew, by intuition rather than experience, were rarely connected with virtue, certainly never in her mind, for her own back was somewhat difficult to fit. Her suspicions were fortunately confirmed. A young man coming from the drugs had snatched off his hat, and was accosting the lady with the unknown back. It was then that she saw with whom she had to deal. The lady was undoubtedly Mrs. Soames, the young man, Mr. Bossini. Concealing herself rapidly over the purchase of a box of Tunisian dates, for she was impatient of awkwardly meeting people with parcels in her hands, and at the busy time of the morning, she was quite unintentionally an interested observer of their little interview. Mrs. Soames, usually somewhat pale, had a delightful colour in her cheeks, and Mr. Bussini's manner was strange, though attractive. She thought him rather a distinguished-looking man, and George's name for him, the buccaneer, about which there was something romantic, quite charming. He seemed to be pleading. Indeed, they talked so earnestly, or rather he talked so earnestly, for Mrs. Soames did not say much, that they caused, inconsiderately, an eddy in the traffic. One nice old general, going towards cigars, was obliged to step quite out of the way, and chancing to look up and see Mrs. Soames's face, he actually took off his hat, the old fool, so like a man. But it was Mrs. Soames's eyes that worried Euphemia. She never once looked at Mr. Bassini until he moved on, and then she looked after him, and, oh, that look! On that look Euphemia had spent much anxious thought, it is not too much to say that it had hurt her with its dark, lingering softness, 
for all the world as though the woman wanted to drag him back, and unsay something she had been saying. Ah, well, she had no time to go deeply into the matter just then, with that prunella silk on her hands, but she was very intriguée, very. She had just nodded to Mrs. Soames to show that she had seen, and, as she confided in talking it over afterwards to her chum Francie, Roger's daughter, didn't she look caught out just? James, most averse at the first blush to accepting any news confirmatory of his own poignant suspicions, took her up at once. Oh, he said, they'd be after wallpapers, no doubt. Euphemia smiled. In the groceries, she said softly, and taking passion and paragoric from the table, added, And so you'll lend me this, dear auntie. Good-bye, and went away. James left almost immediately after. He was late as it was. When he reached the office of Forsyte, Bustard and Forsyte, he found Soames sitting in his revolving chair, drawing up a defence. The latter greeted his father with a curt good morning, and taking an envelope from his pocket, said, "'It may interest you to look through this.' James read as follows. "'309D, Sloan Street, May 15th. "'Dear Forsyte, "'the construction of your house being now completed, "'my duties as architect have come to an end. "'If I am to go on with the business of decoration, "'which at your request I undertook, "'I should like you to clearly understand "'that I must have a free hand.' You never come down without suggesting something that goes counter to my scheme. I have here three letters from you, each of which recommends an article I should never dream of putting in. I had your father here yesterday afternoon, who made further valuable suggestions. Please make up your mind, therefore, whether you want me to decorate for you, or to retire, which, on the whole, I should prefer to do. But understand that if I decorate— I decorate alone, without interference of any sort. If I do the thing, I will do it thoroughly. But I must have a free hand. Yours truly, Philip Bossini. The exact and immediate cause of this letter cannot, of course, be told, though it is not improbable that Bossini may have been moved by some sudden revolt against his position towards Soames, that eternal position of art towards property, which is so admirably summed up on the back of the most indispensable of modern appliances, in a sentence comparable to the very finest in Tacitus. Thos T. Sorrow, inventor, Bert M. Padland, proprietor. "'What are you going to say to him?' James asked. Soames did not even turn his head. "'I haven't made up my mind,' he said, and went on with his defence. A client of his, having put some buildings on a piece of ground that did not belong to him, had been suddenly and most irritatingly warned to take them off again. After carefully going into the facts, however, Soames had seen his way to advise that his client had what was known as a title by possession, and that, though undoubtedly the ground did not belong to him, he was entitled to keep it, and had better do so, and he was now following up this advice by taking steps to— as the sailors say, make it so. He had a distinct reputation for sound advice, people saying of him, "'Go to young Forsyte, a long-headed fellow,' and he prized this reputation highly. His natural taciturnity was in his favour. Nothing could be more calculated to give people, especially people with property, Soames had no other clients, the impression that he was a safe man. And he was safe, Tradition, habit, education, inherited aptitude, native caution, all joined to form a solid professional honesty, superior to temptation, from the very fact that it was built on an innate avoidance of risk. How could he fail, when his soul abhorred circumstances which render a fall possible? A man cannot fall off the floor. And those countless foresights, who, in the course of innumerable transactions concerned with property of all sorts, from wives to water rights, had occasion for the services of a safe man, found it both reposeful and profitable to confide in Soames. That slight superciliousness of his, combined with an air of mousing among precedents, was in his favour too. A man would not be supercilious unless he knew. He was really at the head of the business— 
for though James still came nearly every day to see for himself, he did little now but sit in his chair, twist his legs, slightly confuse things already decided, and presently go away again. And the other partner, Bustard, was a poor thing, who did a great deal of work, but whose opinion was never taken. So Soames went steadily on with his defence. Yet it would be idle to say that his mind was at ease. He was suffering from a sense of impending trouble that had haunted him for some time past. He tried to think it physical, a condition of his liver, but knew that it was not. He looked at his watch. In a quarter of an hour he was due at the general meeting of the new colliery company, one of Uncle Jolyon's concerns. He should see Uncle Jolyon there, and say something to him about Bosini. He had not made up his mind what, but something— in any case, he should not answer this letter until he had seen Uncle Jolyon. He got up, and methodically put away the draft of his defence. Going into a dark little cupboard, he turned up the light, washed his hands with a piece of brown Windsor soap, and dried them on a roller towel. Then he brushed his hair, paying strict attention to the parting, turned down the light, took his hat, and, saying that he would be back at half-past two, stepped into poultry. It was not far to the offices of the new colliery company in Ironmonger Lane, where, and not at the Cannon Street Hotel, in accordance with the more ambitious practice of other companies, the general meeting was always held. Old Jolyon had from the first set his face against the press. What business, he said, had the public with his concerns? Soames arrived on the stroke of time, and took his seat alongside the board, who, in a row, each director behind his own ink-pot, faced their shareholders. In the centre of this row, old Jolyon, conspicuous in his black, tightly-buttoned frock-coat and his white moustaches, was leaning back, with fingertips crossed on a copy of the director's report and accounts. On his right hand, always a little larger than life, sat the secretary, down by the star on Hemmings, an all-too-sad sadness beaming in his fine eyes his iron-grey beard, in mourning like the rest of him, giving the feeling of an all-too-black tie behind it. The occasion, indeed, was a melancholy one, only six weeks having elapsed since that telegram had come from Scurrier, the mining expert, on a private mission to the mines, informing them that Pippin, their superintendent, had committed suicide in endeavouring, after his extraordinary two years' silence, to write a letter to his board. That letter was on the table now. It would be read to the shareholders, who would, of course, be put into possession of all the facts. Hemmings had often said to Soames, standing with his coat-tails divided before the fireplace, "'What our shareholders don't know about our affairs isn't worth knowing. You may take that from me, Mr. Soames.' On one occasion old Jolyon had been present. Soames recollected a little unpleasantness. His uncle had looked up sharply and said, "'Don't talk nonsense, Hemmings. You mean that what they do know isn't worth knowing.' Old Jolyon detested humbug. Hemmings, angry-eyed and wearing a smile like that of a trained poodle, had replied in an outburst of artificial applause, oh, "'Come now, that's very good, sir, that's very good. Your uncle will have his joke.' The next time he had seen Soames, he had taken the opportunity of saying to him, the chairman's getting very old. I can't get him to understand things, and he's so wilful. But what can you expect with a chin like that? Soames had nodded. Everyone knew that Uncle Jolyon's chin was a caution. He was looking worried today, in spite of his general meeting look. He, Soames, should certainly speak to him about Bosini. Behind old Jolyon on the left was little Mr. Booker, and he too wore his general meeting look as though searching for some particularly tender shareholder. And next him was the deaf director, with a frown, and beyond the deaf director again was old Mr. Bleedham, very bland, and having an air of conscious virtue, as well he might, knowing that the brown paper parcel he always brought to the boardroom was concealed behind his hat, one of that old-fashioned class of flat-brimmed top-hats which go with very large bow-ties, clean-shaven lips, fresh cheeks, and neat little white whiskers. 
Soames always attended the general meeting. It was considered better that he should do so, in case anything should arise. He glanced round with his close, supercilious air at the walls of the room, where hung plans of the mine and harbour, together with a large photograph of a shaft, leading to a working which had proved quite remarkably unprofitable. This photograph, a witness to the eternal irony underlying commercial enterprise, still retained its position on the wall, an effigy of the director's pet, but dead lamb. And now old Jolyon rose to present the report and accounts. Veiling under a Jove-like serenity that perpetual antagonism deep-seated in the bosom of a director towards his shareholders, he faced them calmly. Soames faced them, too. He knew most of them by sight. There was old Scrub Soul, a tar man who always came, as Hemmings would say, to make himself nasty, a cantankerous-looking old fellow with a red face, a jowl, and an enormous low-crowned hat reposing on his knee and the Reverend Mr. Bombs, who always proposed a vote of thanks to the chairman, in which he invariably expressed the hope that the board would not forget to elevate their employees, using the word with a double E as being more vigorous and Anglo-Saxon. He had the strong imperialistic tendencies of his cloth. It was his salutary custom to buttonhole the director afterwards, and ask him whether he thought the coming year would be good or bad, and according to the trend of the answer, to buy or sell three shares within the ensuing fortnight. And there was that military man, Major O'Bally, who could not help speaking, if only to second the re-election of the auditor, and who sometimes caused serious consternation by taking toast—proposals, rather—out of the hands of persons who had been flattered with little slips of paper, entrusting the said proposals to their care. These made up the lot, together with four or five strong, silent shareholders, with whom Soames could sympathise, men of business, who liked to keep an eye on their affairs for themselves, without being fussy, good, solid men, who came to the city every day, and went back in the evening to good, solid wives. Good, solid wives! There was something in that thought which roused the nameless uneasiness in Soames again. What should he say to his uncle? What answer should he make to this letter? "'If any shareholder has any question to put, I shall be glad to answer it.' A soft thump. Old Jolyon had let the report and accounts fall, and stood twisting his tortoiseshell glasses between thumb and forefinger. The ghost of a smile appeared on Soames's face. They had better hurry up with their questions. He well knew his uncle's method, the ideal one of at once saying, I propose, then, that the report and accounts be adopted. Never let them get their wind. Shareholders were notoriously wasteful of time. A tall, white-bearded man, with a gaunt, dissatisfied face, arose. I believe I am in order, Mr. Chairman, in raising a question on this figure of five thousand pounds in the accounts. To the widow and family, he looked sourly round, of our late superintendent, who so uh, ill-advisedly—I say ill-advisedly—committed suicide at a time when his services were of the utmost value to this company. You have stated that the agreement which he has so unfortunately cut short with his own hand was for a period of five years, of which only one had expired. I—' Old Jolyon made a gesture of impatience. "'I believe I am in order, Mr. Chairman. I ask whether this amount paid, or proposed to be paid, by the board to the uh, deceased, is for services which might have been rendered to the company, had he not committed suicide?' "'It is in recognition of past services, which we all know, you as well as any of us, to have been of vital value.' And then, sir, all I have to say is that the service is being passed, the amount is too much. The shareholder sat down. Old Jolyon waited a second, and said, I now propose that the report and— The shareholder rose again. May I ask if the board realises that it is not their money, which I don't hesitate to say that if it were their money— A second shareholder, with a round, dogged face— 
whom Soames recognised as the late superintendent's brother-in-law, got up and said warmly, "'In my opinion, sir, the sum is not enough.' The Reverend Mr. Bonds now rose to his feet. "'If I may venture to express myself,' he said, "'I should say that the fact of the deceased having committed suicide "'should weigh very heavily, very heavily, with our worthy chairman. "'I have no doubt that it has weighed with him, for I say this for myself, "'and I think for every one present. "'Hear, yeah, hear. Yeah. "'He enjoys our confidence in a high degree. "'We all desire, I should hope, to be charitable, but I feel sure.' he looked severely at the late superintendent's brother-in-law, that he will in some way, by some written expression, or better, perhaps, by reducing the amount, record our grave disapproval that so promising and valuable a life should have been thus impiously removed from a sphere where both its own interests and, if I may say so, our interests, so imperatively demanded its continuance. We should not— Nay, we may not countenance so grave a dereliction of all duty, both human and divine. The reverend gentleman resumed his seat. The late superintendent's brother-in-law again rose. "'What I have said I stick to,' he said. "'The amount is not enough.' The first shareholder struck in. "'I challenge the legality of the payment. In my opinion this payment is not legal.' The company's solicitor is present. I believe I am in order in asking him the question. All eyes were now turned upon Soames. Something had arisen. He stood up, close-lipped and cold, his nerves inwardly fluttered, his attention tweaked away at last from contemplation of that cloud looming on the horizon of his mind. "'The point,' he said in a low, thin voice, "'is by no means clear.' As there is no possibility of future consideration being received, it is doubtful whether the payment is strictly legal. If it is desired, the opinion of the court could be taken. The superintendent's brother-in-law frowned, and said in a meaning tone, "'We have no doubt the opinion of the court could be taken. May I ask the name of the gentleman who has given us that striking piece of information?' "'Mr. Soames, Forsyte, indeed.' He looked from Soames to old Jolyon in a pointed manner. A flush coloured Soames's pale cheeks, but his superciliousness did not waver. Old Jolyon fixed his eyes on the speaker. "'If,' he said, "'the late superintendent's brother-in-law has nothing more to say, "'I propose that the report and accounts—' At this moment, however, there rose one of those five silent, stolid shareholders who had excited Soames's sympathy. He said, "'I deprecate the proposal altogether. We are expected to give charity to this man's wife and children, who, you tell us, were dependent on him. They may have been. I do not care whether they were or not. I object to the whole thing on principle.' It is a high time a stand was made against this sentimental humanitarianism. The country is eaten up with it. I object to my money being paid to these people of whom I know nothing, who have done nothing to earn it. I object in toto. It is not business. I now move that the reports and accounts be put back, and amended by striking out the grant altogether. Old Jolyon had remained standing, while the strong, silent man was speaking. The speech awoke an echo in all hearts, voicing, as it did, the worship of strong men, the movement against generosity, which, at that time, already commenced among the saner members of the community. The words, "'It is not business,' had moved even the board. Privately, every one felt that indeed it was not, but they knew also the chairman's domineering temper and tenacity. He, too, at heart, must feel that it was not business— but he was committed to his own proposition. Would he go back upon it? It was thought to be unlikely. All wasted with interest, old Jolyon held up his hand. Dark-rimmed glasses, depending between his finger and thumb, quivered slightly, with a suggestion of menace. He addressed the strong, silent shareholder. 
"'Knowing, as you do, the efforts of our late superintendent upon the occasion of the explosion at the mines, do you seriously wish me to put that amendment, sir?' "'I do.' Old Jolyon put the amendment. "'Does any one second this?' he asked, looking calmly round. And it was then that Soames, looking at his uncle, felt the power of will that was in that old man. No one stirred. Looking straight into the eyes of the strong, silent shareholder, old Jolyon said, "'I now move that the report and accounts for the year 1886 be received and adopted. You second that? Those in favour signify the same in the usual way. Contrary? No. Carried. The next business, gentlemen.' Soames smiled. Certainly Uncle Jolyon had a way with him. But now his attention relapsed upon Bosinney. Odd how that fellow haunted his thoughts, even in business hours. Irene's visit to the house. But there was nothing in that, except that she might have told him. But then again she never did tell him anything. She was more silent, more touchy every day. He wished to God the house were finished, and they were in it, away from London. Town did not suit her. Her nerves were not strong enough. That nonsense of the separate room had cropped up again. The meeting was breaking up now. Under the photograph of the lost shaft, Hemmings was buttonholed by the Reverend Mr. Bombs. Little Mr. Booker, his bristling eyebrows wreathed in angry smiles, was having a parting turn-up with old Scrubsole. The two hated each other like poison. There was some matter of a tar contract between them, little Mr. Booker having secured it from the board for a nephew of his, over old Scrubsole's head. Soames had heard that from Hemmings, who liked to gossip, more especially about his directors, except, indeed, old Jolyon, of whom he was afraid. Soames awaited his opportunity. The last shareholder was vanishing through the door when he approached his uncle, who was putting on his hat. "'Can I speak to you for a minute, Uncle Jolyon?' It is uncertain what Soames expected to get out of this interview. Apart from that somewhat mysterious awe in which Forsytes in general held old Jolyon, due to his philosophic twist, or perhaps, as Hemmings would doubtless have said, to his chin, there was, and always had been, a subtle antagonism between the younger man and the old, it had lurked under their dry manner of greeting, under their non-committal allusions to each other, and arose, perhaps, from old Jolyon's perception of the quiet tenacity—obstinacy, he rather naturally called it—of the young man, of a secret doubt whether he could get his own way with him. Both these foresights, wide asunder as the poles in many respects, possessed in their different ways, to a greater degree than the rest of the family, that essential quality of tenacious and prudent insight into affairs, which is the high watermark of their great class. Either of them, with a little luck and opportunity, was equal to a lofty career. Either of them would have made a good financier, a great contractor, a statesman, though old Jolyon, in certain of his moods, when under the influence of a cigar or of nature, would have been capable of not perhaps despising, but certainly of questioning his own high position, while Soames, who never smoked cigars, would not. Then, too, in old Jolyon's mind there was always the secret ache that the son of James, of James, who he had always thought such a poor thing, should be pursuing the paths of success, while his own son— And last, not least— for he was no more outside the radiation of family gossip than any other foresight, he had now heard the sinister, indefinite, but none the less disturbing rumour about Bosinney, and his pride was wounded to the quick. Characteristically, his irritation turned not against Irene, but against Soames. The idea that his nephew's wife—why couldn't the fellow take better care of her? Oh, quaint injustice, as though Soames could possibly take more care— should be drawing to herself June's lover, was intolerably humiliating. And seeing the danger, he did not, like James, hide it away in sheer nervousness, but owned, with the dispassion of his broader outlook, 
that it was not unlikely. There was something very attractive about Irene. He had a presentiment on the subject of Soames's communication as they left the boardroom together, and went out into the noise and hurry of Cheapside. They walked together a good minute without speaking, Soames with his mousing, mincing step, and old Jolyon upright and using his umbrella languidly as a walking-stick. They turned presently into comparative quiet, for old Jolyon's way to a second board led him in the direction of Moorgate Street. Then Soames, without lifting his eyes, began, "'I've had this letter from Bosini. You see what he says. I thought I'd let you know. I've spent a lot more than I intended on this house, and I want the position to be clear.' Old Jolyon ran his eyes unwillingly over the letter. "'What he says is clear enough,' he said. "'He talks about a free hand,' replied Soames. Old Jolyon looked at him. The long-suppressed irritation and antagonism towards this young fellow, whose affairs were beginning to intrude upon his own, burst from him. "'Well, if you don't trust him, why do you employ him?' Soames stole a sideways look. "'It's much too late to go into that,' he said. "'I only want it to be quite understood that if I give him a free hand, he doesn't let me in. I thought if you were to speak to him, it would carry more weight.' "'No,' said old Jolyon abruptly. "'I'll have nothing to do with it.' The words of both uncle and nephew gave the impression of unspoken meanings, far more important behind and the look they interchanged was like a revelation of this consciousness. "'Well,' said Soames, "'I thought, for June's sake, I'd tell you, that's all. I thought you'd better know I shan't stand any nonsense.' "'What's that to me?' Old Jolyon took him up. "'Oh, I don't know,' said Soames, and flurried by that sharp look he was unable to say more. "'Don't say I didn't tell you,' he added sulkily. "'recovering his composure. "'Tell me,' said old Jolyon, "'I don't know what you mean. "'You come worrying me about a thing like this. "'I don't want to hear about your affairs. "'You must manage them yourself.' "'Very well,' said Soames immovably. "'I will.' "'Good morning, then,' said old Jolyon. "'And they parted. "'Soames retraced his steps.' and going into a celebrated eating-house, asked for a plate of smoked salmon and a glass of shambly. He seldom ate much in the middle of the day, and generally ate standing, finding the position beneficial to his liver, which was very sound, but to which he desired to put down all his troubles. When he had finished, he went slowly back to his office, with bent head, taking no notice of the swarming thousands on the pavement, who, in their turn, took no notice of him. The evening post carried the following reply to Bosini. Foresight, Bustard and Foresight, Commissioners for Oaths, 92001, Branch Lane, Poultry, E.C., May the 17th, 1887. Dear Bosini, I have received your letter, the terms of which not a little surprise me. I was under the impression that you had, and have had all along, a free hand, for I do not recollect that any suggestions I have been so unfortunate as to make have met with your approval. In giving you, in accordance with your request, this free hand, I wish you to clearly understand that the total cost of the house, as handed over to me, completely decorated, inclusive of your fee, as arranged between us, must not exceed twelve thousand pounds. Repeated in figures. This gives you an ample margin, and, as you know, is far more than I originally contemplated. I am, yours truly, Soames Forsyte. On the following day he received a note from Bassini. Philip Baines Bassini, architect, 309D Sloane Street, S.W., May the 18th. Dear Forsyte, if you think that in such a delicate matter as decoration I can bind myself to the exact pound, I am afraid you are mistaken. I can see that you are tired of the arrangement, and of me, and I had better, therefore, resign. Yours faithfully, Philip Baines Bossini. Soames pondered long and painfully over his answer, and late at night in the dining-room, 
When Irene had gone to bed, he composed the following. 62 Montpellier Square, Southwest, May 19th, 1887. Dear Bassini, I think that in both our interests it would be extremely undesirable that matters should be so left at this stage. I did not mean to say that if you should exceed the sum named in my letter to you by ten or twenty or even fifty pounds, there would be any difficulty between us. This being so, I should like you to reconsider your answer. You have a free hand in the terms of this correspondence, and I hope you will see your way to completing the decorations in the matter of which I know it is difficult to be absolutely exact. Yours truly, Soames Forsyth. Bosini's answer, which came in the course of the next day, was, May 20th, Dear Foresight, Very well, P. H. Bosini. End of Part 2, Chapter 5「Part Two, Chapter Six of the Man of Property. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Janet West. The Foresight Saga, The Man of Property by John Galsworthy. Part Two, Chapter Six, Old Jolyon at the Zoo. Old Jolyon disposed of his second meeting, an ordinary board, summarily. He was so dictatorial that his fellow directors were left in cabal over the increasing domineeringness of old Forsyte, which they were far from intending to stand much longer, they said. He went out by underground to Portland Road Station, whence he took a cab and drove to the zoo. He had an assignation there one of those assignations that had lately been growing more frequent, to which his increasing uneasiness about June and the change in her, as he expressed it, was driving him. She buried herself away, and was growing thin. If he spoke to her, he got no answer, or had his head snapped off, or she looked as if she would burst into tears. She was as changed as she could be, all this through Bassini. As for telling him anything, not a bit of it and he would sit for long spells brooding, his paper unread before him, a cigar extinct between his lips. She had been such a companion to him ever since she was three years old, and he loved her so. Forces regardless of family or class or custom were beating down his guard. Impending events over which he had no control threw their shadows on his head. The irritation of one accustomed to have his way was roused against he knew not what. Chafing at the slowness of his cab, he reached the zoo door, but, with his sunny instinct for seizing the good of each moment, he forgot his vexation as he walked towards the tryst. From the stone terrace above the bear pit, his son and his two grandchildren came hastening down when they saw old Julian coming, and led him away towards the lion house. They supported him on either side, holding one to each of his hands, whilst Jolly, perverse like his father, carried his grandfather's umbrella in such a way as to catch people's legs with the crutch of the handle. Young Jolyon followed. It was as good as a play to see his father with the children, but such a play as brings smiles with tears behind. An old man and two small children walking together can be seen at any hour of the day, but the sight of old Jolyon, with Jolly and Holly, seemed to young Jolyon a special peep-show of the things that lie at the bottom of our hearts. The complete surrender of that erect old figure to those little figures on either hand was too poignantly tender, and, being a man of an habitual reflex action, young Jolyon swore softly under his breath. The show affected him in a way unbecoming to a foresight, who is nothing if not undemonstrative. Thus they reached the lion-house. There had been a morning fete at the botanical gardens, and a large number of foresight, that is, of well-dressed people who kept carriages had brought on to the zoo, so as to have more, if possible, for their money, before going back to Rutland Gate or Bryanston Square. "'Let's go on to the zoo,' they had said to each other. "'It'll be great fun. 
It was a shilling day, and there would not be all those horrid common people. In front of the long line of cages, they were collected in rows, watching the tawny, ravenous beasts behind the bars await their only pleasure of the four-and-twenty hours. The hungrier the beast, the greater the fascination. But whether because the spectators envied his appetite, or, more humanely, because it was so soon to be satisfied, young Jolyon could not tell. Remarks kept falling on his ears. That's a nasty-looking brute, that tiger. Oh, what a love! Look at his little mouth. Yes, he's rather nice. Don't go too near, mother. And frequently, with little pats, one or another would clap their hands to their pockets behind and look around, as though expecting young Jolyon or some disinterested-looking person to relieve them of the contents. A well-fed man in a white waistcoat said slowly through his teeth, "'It's all greed. They can't be hungry. Why, they take no exercise.' At these words a tiger snatched a piece of bleeding liver, and the fat man laughed. His wife, in a Paris model frock and gold nose nippers, reproved him. "'How can you laugh, Harry? Such a horrid sight!' Young Jolyon frowned. The circumstances of his life, though he had ceased to take too personal a view of them, had left him subject to an intermittent contempt, and the class to which he had belonged, the carriage class, especially excited his sarcasm. To shut up a lion or a tiger in confinement was surely a horrible barbarity, but no cultivated person would admit this. The idea of it being barbarous to confine wild animals had probably never even occurred to his father, for instance. He belonged to the old school, who considered it at once humanizing and educational to confine baboons and panthers, holding the view, no doubt, that in course of time they might induce these creatures not so unreasonably to die of misery and heart-sickness against the bars of their cages, and put the society to the expense of getting others. In his eyes, as in the eyes of all Forsytes, the pleasure of seeing these beautiful creatures in a state of captivity far outweighed the inconvenience of imprisonment to beasts whom God had so improvidently placed in a state of freedom. It was for the animal's good, removing them at once from the countless dangers of open air and exercise, and enabling them to exercise their functions in the guaranteed seclusion of a private compartment. Indeed, it was doubtful what wild animals were made for but to be shut up in cages. But as young Jolyon had in his constitution the elements of impartiality, he reflected that to stigmatize as barbarity that which was merely lack of imagination must be wrong, for none who held these views had been placed in a similar position to the animals they caged, and could not, therefore, be expected to enter into their sensations. It was not until they were leaving the gardens, jolly and holly in a state of blissful delirium, that old Jolyon found an opportunity of speaking to his son on the matter next to his heart. "'I don't know what to make of it,' he said. "'If she's to go on as she's going on now, I can't tell what's to come. I wanted her to see the doctor, but she won't. She's not a bit like me. She's your mother all over, obstinate as a mule. If she doesn't want to do a thing, she won't, and there's an end of it.' Young Jolyon smiled. His eyes had wandered to his father's chin. A pair of you, he thought, but he said nothing. And then, went on old Jolyon, there's this Bassini. I should like to punch the fellow's head, but I can't, I suppose, though I don't see why you shouldn't, he added doubtfully. What has he done? Far better that it should come to an end if they don't hit it off. Old Jolyon looked at his son. Now they had actually come to discuss a subject connected with the relations between the sexes, he felt distrustful. Joe would be sure to hold some loose view or another. "'Well, I don't know what you think,' he said. "'I dare say your sympathies with him. Shouldn't be surprised. But I think he's behaving precious badly, and if he comes my way I shall tell him so.' He dropped the subject. It was impossible to discuss with his son the true nature and meaning of Bassini's defection. Had not his son done the very same thing, worse, if possible, fifteen years ago? There seemed no end to the consequences of that piece of folly. Young Jolyon was also silent. He had quickly penetrated his father's thought, for, dethroned from the high seat of an obvious and uncomplicated view of things, he had become both perceptive and subtle. The attitude he had adopted towards sexual matters fifteen years before, however, was too different from his father's. 
there was no bridging the gulf. He said coolly, I suppose he's fallen in love with some other woman? Old Jolyon gave him a dubious look. I can't tell, he said. They say so. Then it's probably true, remarked young Jolyon unexpectedly. And I suppose they've told you who she is? Yes, said old Jolyon. Soames's wife. Young Jolyon did not whistle. The circumstances of his own life had rendered him incapable of whistling on such a subject, but he looked at his father while the ghost of a smile hovered over his face. If old Jolyon saw, he took no notice. She and June were bosom friends, he muttered. Poor little June, said young Jolyon softly. He thought of his daughter still as a babe of three. Old Jolyon came to a sudden halt. I don't believe a word of it, he said. It's some old woman's tale. Get me a cab, Joe. I'm tired to death. They stood at a corner to see if an empty cab would come along, while carriage after carriage drove past, bearing foresights of all descriptions from the zoo. The harness, the liveries, the gloss on the horses' coats shone and glittered in the May sunlight, and each equipage, Landau, Sociable, Barouche, Victoria, or Brougham, seemed to roll out proudly from its wheels. I and my horses and my men, you know. Indeed, the whole turnout have cost a pot, but we were worth it every penny. Look at Master and at Mrs. Now, the dogs. Ease with security. Ah, that's the ticket. And such, as everyone knows, is fit accompaniment for a perambulating foresight. Amongst these carriages was a barouche coming at greater pace than the others, drawn by a pair of bright bay horses. It swung on its high springs, and the four people who filled it seemed rocked as in a cradle. This chariot attracted young Jolyon's attention, and suddenly, on the back seat, he recognized his Uncle James, unmistakable in spite of the increased whiteness of his whiskers. Opposite, their backs defended by sunshades, Rachel Forsythe and her elder but married sister, Winifred Darty, in irreproachable toilettes, had posed their heads haughtily, like two of the birds they had been seeing in the zoo, while by James's side reclined Darty, in a brand new frock coat buttoned tight and square, with a large expanse of carefully shot linen protruding below each wristband. An extra, if subdued sparkle, an added touch of the best gloss or varnish characterized this vehicle, and seemed to distinguish it from all the others, as though by some happy extravagance like that which marks out the real work of art from the ordinary picture, it were designated as the typical car, the very throne of foresightdom. Old Jillian did not see them pass. He was petting poor Holly, who was tired, but those in the carriage had taken in the little group. The ladies' heads tilted suddenly. There was a spasmodic screening movement of parasols. James's face protruded naively, like the head of a long bird, his mouth slowly opening. The shield-like rounds of the parasols grew smaller and smaller, and vanished. Young Jolyon saw that he had been recognized, even by Winifred, who could not have been more than fifteen when he had forfeited the right to be considered a foresight. There was not much change in them. He remembered the exact look of their turnout all that time ago. Horses, men, carriage, all different now, no doubt, but of the precise stamp of fifteen years before. The same neat display— the same nicely calculated arrogance, ease with security. The swing exact, the pose of the sunshades exact, exact the spirit of the whole thing. And in the sunlight, defended by the haughty shields of parasols, carriage after carriage went by. Uncle James has just passed with his female folk, said young Jolyon. His father looked black. Did your uncle see us? Yes? <laughs> What's he want coming down to these parts? An empty cab drove up at this moment, and old Jolyon stopped it. I shall see you again before long, my boy, he said. Don't you go paying any attention to what I've been saying about young Bassini. I don't believe a word of it. Kissing the children, who tried to detain him, he stepped in and was borne away. Young Jolyon, who had taken Holly up in his arms, stood motionless at the corner, looking after the cab. End of Part 2, Chapter 6 Recording by Janet West